the limelight. He chooses not to be in front of these cameras because he doesn't have to be. Um, he chooses not to say much because he doesn't want to. And that's almost something I respect so much about him. He's not in this for the wrong reasons. He's not in this behind me to make a bunch of money on me. He's in this to make me one of the greatest pantomimes that's ever lived and to make me money. And he puts me first before himself, and I know that for a fact because I've known him since nobody wanted to hold pads for me and he was willing to do so and pay for my lunches afterwards and let me sleep on his floor on an air mattress and give me things when I had nothing to give him. Somebody that's that selfless, that I had no reason that I would ever give him money at that beginning portion. You know, I just know how loyal and what type of a heart he has and uh, that's somebody that I like to be around and like to mold myself after. Not to mention, he's, he's a pretty old guy, so he's got some wisdom, you know? <laughs> you mentioned that, like, that you couldn't get anyone to hold pads for you. You know, before WBC, there really wasn't a promotion that had guys from a lighter weight class on. How much did that promotion mean to actually jump-starting your career and putting you where you are today? The promotion? Yeah. The WC. Mm -hmm. WC was huge for me. Um, not only because it was the first televised bout that I was ever on, ever. In my, you know, in my career, but also because it's built lighter weight classes, like we just said. I mean, you look at 135, 145; they did not exist until the WEC was willing to give them, a, give us a try. Um, Reed Harris started these weight classes, gave us a try, and you know, look at it now; it's exploded, and it's really shown what the that lighter guys can fight too. We have a different skill set. We may not all have the knockout power as a heavyweight. But we bring a different skill set to the table that's still interesting and fun to watch. And the WEC was able to showcase that. Not to mention that since we weren't the UFC, the only question we ever got was, when are you going to be in the UFC? That put a chip on all of our shoulders, and we all went out there and fought our hearts out and made some of the greatest fights in the history of fighting in the WEC days, for sure. Dom, you mentioned that um, it's not just about fighting. There's other things to it. The media, being in front of the cameras, that kind of thing. When you see fighters kind of not want to do that kind of stuff and kind of they're kind of cold to the media and there are some champions like that does that yep. frustrate you does that make you does that make you wonder why it makes me wonder why a little bit but it just makes me more know that they just don't get it they don't get it these people with the cameras these people uh, with the UFC that are getting you up at six in the morning to do a media day in LA I don't like waking up at six in the morning any better than anybody else but the truth is these they're here for you they're here to promote you these cameras are here to put me out there so that my fight wants to be watched and people can have an understanding of what I'm doing. So, you gotta do it. Um, and you have to represent yourself in a professional way because it just helps helps the sport be more interesting. Plain and simple, it's, really, it's not rocket science. Uh, there's more to the sport than just fighting. And you either understand that or you don't. And if you don't, then I promise you, the guys that are worth money don't wanna fight you because you don't get it. Demetrius Johnson is a guy that's kind of said stuff like that, where I just want to fight, I don't want to work with the media, that kind of thing. He's a champion, one of the best power pound fighters in the world. He's not get a lot of, you know, peer review buys don't really do all that well, ratings don't really do all that well. Um, is, is he someone that you kind of used an example of that? Well, it sounds like you made an example of it, so I can talk on it, sure. as you mentioned it. Um, if you're going to use Demetrius Johnson as an example, I would say, yeah, that, that's probably a fair example. I mean. But I think that part of that is because Demetrius doesn't feel that he has maybe necessarily the outpush in front of the cameras that he wishes he could possibly. So he just says, I don't want to worry about it. I'm going to focus on what I can control, which is the fighting aspect of things. And I think that I know Demetrius on a personal level. And I think that his mindset is, I'm just going to focus a thousand percent on fighting and nothing else. And if I do that, not, and as long as I keep winning and keep breaking records and get the most belts of anybody, you can't deny me what I deserve. Right. And I, that's one way of approaching it. So you got the Demetrius Johnson approach, which is, I'm going to fight and anybody you put in front of me, I'm going to beat and I'm going to dominate and I'm going to school them. And so you can't deny me the fame that I deserve. Or you can go the Conor McGregor, Ronda Rousey route, which is, I'm going to take three, four fights. I'm going to talk. I'm going to say what I need to say. I'm going to be great in front of the cameras. I'm going to be charismatic. I'm going to be on movies. I'm going to get Instagram, uh, Twitter, and social media to follow. And with that, it doesn't matter if I win or lose in fights. I'm still famous, and I'm always going to get the big fight because media wants to see it. So there's two different approaches you can take. I respect Demetrius Johnson's approach, and I respect Conor McGregor and Ronda Rousey's approach. You know, 
And but I think that the best in the world, as the sport continues to evolve, we'll be able to find a happy medium of both. Sid Northcutt is the guy that a lot of fighters have criticized because he hasn't really accomplished a whole lot yet in the sport, yet he's someone the UFC's really gotten behind as far as the promotional push. Um, there's some resentment for fighters, but how, how much how much is it the fighters' responsibility to promote themselves, and how much is the UFC's responsibility to push the fighters to that? Well, when you when you mention Sage Northcutt, it's, it, that's what the bitterness comes from. I think is that certain people come in, and the UFC doesn't necessarily push them at all, and then guys that are brand new that don't even push themselves, like Sage Northcutt, doesn't necessarily go out of his way to do all this stuff, but he gets it anyways because he has a look, because he has a skill set that's dynamic and fun to watch. So I can understand the bitterness, but it doesn't do any good to be bitter. You have two choices. Right. You can take what you're given, or you can build with what you've got. Right. I choose to build with what I've got and try to make the best of it, because I've still been given a stage. I've still got cameras in front of my face when I want them, and I plan to run with them. Um, I'm not going to sit and be sad about what other people are getting, because that doesn't get you anywhere in life except sitting right where you're at, crying and complaining about TJ Delsha. Um, you have the fight, obviously, with Uriah, and it's a big uh, rivalry. You guys have always had that heat between you. What is it you think really sparked it? Ego. I think his ego is just too big for me to handle. I think that that's his worst enemy. I think that I don't need to be favored because his ego will always beat him himself. I think that he's got excuses for every loss he's ever had. He's been TKO'd three times. He still doesn't admit any of those losses or being TKO'd. How do you grow from an experience like that if you don't accept the way that you lost by the person that beat you? You can't grow. You know, going through these surgeries and, the, and the, the bad fortunes that I've gone through has made me realize one thing. You have to accept the bad things and make a great thing out of it because it'll actually turn you into a machine if you can bask in it and enjoy it and take it for what it is and let it make you a stronger person. If you fight it and say, you know, those injuries, you know, it, I'll be fine. It's no big deal. You know, I took those injuries and I, I grabbed onto them and I said, you know what, this is going to make me better. I'm not going to allow this to hold me back and, and put a freeze on my career and say that Dominic could have done this if he wasn't hurt. That didn't happen. All those years I was gone, I used them very well, um, efficiently to make me a stronger, mentally better person, a better man. I evolved with those experiences. And somebody like Faber, in my opinion, who's always making excuses for his losses and such, that's his ego talking. He can't admit the fact that he's been beaten. So therefore, he won't grow from those experiences, which creates a stationary, stagnant mindset in a sport that you can only grow in, otherwise you get passed by. All of the adversity that you went through, what was the toughest for you to take on and face and then turn around and change into something that you learned from? One of the hardest ones was definitely my second ACL, but I think even harder than that was when I blew my quad out because I had the second ACL and then I was getting ready to fight Hindenburg off the belt, finally, training really hard and then my quad blew out and it wasn't an ACL and it wasn't, it was just bad enough that I'd be out for three months or so, but not weak enough that I could still fight. My leg wasn't working. So at that point, you kind of just hold your hands in the air and go, really, what do you want me to do, God? Like, what else do you want me to do? I've been through two ACLs. I keep coming back. I keep trying. And you just keep taking these opportunities from me. But it's, that is the idea behind those things. Is I went through that for a reason because he was, in my personal opinion, my higher power is God. And he's putting me through these things in order to pull the better out of me, make me stronger. But I can't get the best out of it unless I accept it, take it, and run with it. And that's what I've done. So I just... The quad was probably the worst one just because I had to vacate my title. I had to give up everything I worked for, not because I lost, but because I was injured. And that's just like, and then you get the guys like Faber who's always bashing on you for it. Like, oh, you meant to get hurt, you know, you're, you're, you're not built, whatever. It's like, when you can't fight, you can't say anything about it. That's what's hard about it. So it's like, you kind of just got to take it and say, okay, yeah, whatever he says, because he's still competing. And I'm just gonna have to sit on my hands and wait until I can compete again. Well, guess what? I'm here again, I'm talking again. You're not getting rid of me. I won the belt again. You still need me to have the belt again. And this division's right back where it was. Everybody's talking, everybody's talking about it. I mean, when I didn't have the belt, when I was out, who was talking about the 135 pound division? You couldn't even name the top five in the division. They kept doing rematches with Hen and Burrell who got beat up by Dillashaw, they kept doing rematches because they had nothing else to sell, they had nothing else to go with. Why? Because everybody knew I was the champion. Everybody knew that they needed me back to prove who was the best. And then I went and beat T. 
TJ Dillshaw. And now here I am again getting my rematch and things are right back where they started in 2012. Why is that? Four years later, nothing changed. Faber didn't touch the belt. Why? He had plenty of time when I was out. He was scared to face the guy. So I went in there and did it for him. Do, do you see any evolution in his game in the last four years since the last time you guys fought, or do you think he's basically the same fighter he was back in uh, back at UFC 132? I think he's probably a little bit wiser in his business sense. He's grown a little bit wiser in being a man because you know you still evolve as a man or whatever outside of fighting. But as for fighting itself, I mean, I don't. What changes do you see? I mean, he's overhand right. He's got a guillotine. He can wrestle well. He's scrambly. That's Uriah Faber. He's been that way since 2007 when I fought him. Um, so you, you spoke about his ego uh, and the ways in which you think that's affected him negatively. Well, but what did I say? I said that that's why I don't think that he's grown. It's because of his ego. Your ego, if you're not able to accept the things that you haven't done right and look at them and put your ego aside and say, you're right, I'm not good at this, this, and this, then you can't grow, you can't build those things. He's unwilling to do so, and I think that's what's kept him stagnant and stationary in his fight career.